Hey, our final speaker of the morning session is Laura Anderson, who will speak on new aspects of heterotic geometry. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for what has been a lovely meeting so far. Uh, this is a beautiful location. And like Wadi, I was in Geneva last week, and, and this feels really wonderful being here and not being 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So thank you for arranging the good weather as well. Um, today, I want to tell you a little bit about um, new aspects of heterotic geometry. This was a deliberately vague title because I had a couple of projects and I wasn't quite sure which heterotic project I was going to be telling you about today. Um, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about a poorly understood correspondence in heterotic theories and an attempt to understand this at a geometric level. Um, this work is going to be based on a paper that appeared three years ago with my PhD student, Ha Feng, and also work that is in progress with James Gray, a collaborator at Virginia Tech, and our postdocs, Paul Ullman and Nikhil Raghuram. So, um, the motivation for this work. Um, in compactifications of heterotic string theory, uh, from a physics point of view, these are a challenging arena to try and write down effective theories because details of the effective physics in four dimensions that you would achieve, N equals one, supersymmetric theories, um, yang mills theories coupled to supergravity, these are very closely tied to, in principle, many different uh, difficult problems in the geometry of calabi yau manifolds and vector bundles over them. Um, specifically, in order to satisfy supersymmetry conditions, you have to explicitly decide whether vector bundles uh, are stable in a, a Mumford sense that I'll talk about more in a minute, um, holomorphic. Uh, the form of the 4D potential in the N equals 1 theory uh, is determined by uh, holomorphic Trin Simons theory, Gukov Witten type superpotentials, Gukov Baka Witten type superpotentials, and the massless spectra, bundle valued cohomology, Yoneda products. There's a lot of geometry that has to be explicitly realized before you can write down a field theory at the end of the day. And even things like the matter field Kähler potential are still extremely difficult in principle uh, to be able to write down. So features that you really want of the 4D theory, difficult to extract. Um, in particular, it's difficult to engineer the 4D theory of your choice. So a lot of work has been done by myself and others scanning over huge order 10 to the hundreds of different solutions of heterotic string theory to try and find certain effective theories with properties you want. For example, uh, things like the, the particle spectrum of the standard model of particle physics uh, or other you know, field theories of interest. So the goal here is better control of the geometry of heterotic bundles and manifolds. This would be very helpful if we understood more about how to write down the properties of the field theory um, read off in a more simple way from the properties of this geometry. So better linking of heterotic effective field theory and geometry is what I'm after. So, in this talk, I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about a repackaging of heterotic geometry that may shed some light on redundancies in the space of, he space of heterotic vacua. Um, what I mean by that is different geometries that can give rise to the same effective field theory. Um, and two bits of structure sort of inspired this work, and I want to tell you about each of them. Um, the first is that it has been observed for quite a while in literature and in more detail in the last 10 years or so that the heterotic moduli space naturally combines fluctuations of the background manifold and gauge fields, specifically fluctuations of metrics and connections, get combined in very specific ways in a heterotic compactification. And I'm going to talk about how to package that geometry in a way that makes uh, the natural geometric objects a bit more obvious. And I also want to talk about dualities in quotes. These are poorly understood. Um, but correspondences of heterotic theories, which are going to, again, naturally mix notions of base manifolds and vector bundles over them, um, and this is going to be building on work, again, from some time ago in the 90s, um, initially by Dissler and Katru, and more recently studied by Blumenhagen and collaborators, and uh, more recently still by my student, Hafeng and I. So with that, um, what is it that I'm going to actually tell you? Um, the redundancies that I want to talk about are inspired by an observation in 0-2 gauge linear sigma models from the 90s. And this observation is, is not a duality in the strict string sense in that it is at the moment just a set of combinatorics at the level of a GLSM that happen to give you the same effective physics in four dimensions. So the observation of Dissler and Katru was that if you have two distinct uh, zero two gauge linear sigma models which share a non-geometric, um, in many cases, Landau-Ginsberg vacuum, uh, in this case, there can be two large volume limits uh, corresponding to two different manifolds x and x tilde and vector bundles v and v tilde over them that can give the same apparent 4D effective, at least massless spectrum of the theory. So what do I mean by massless spectrum? In a heterotic compactification, that's counted by bundle-valued cohomology groups. Um, things like these wedge powers of the bundle, the cohomology of those, that counts the charged matter in a heterotic theory. And um, perhaps most, most importantly, 
the sum of all the singlet degrees of freedom in the theory, i.e. all sources of moduli, seems to be preserved in this correspondence. So you have the familiar H21 and H11 moduli of the Calabiao coupled to the bundled moduli. This gets preserved across this correspondence, but the individual numbers are going to vary. So you have topologically distinct manifolds and bundles. They seem to give at least the same massless spectrum. Um, in about five, six years ago, Blumenhagen and Ron created a data set of about 83,000 target space dual pairs using uh, toric complete intersection uh, manifolds, specifically toric hypersurfaces that Wadi was just talking about, and um, vector bundles over them. And they found that in nearly all cases, the 4D massless spectrum was preserved, about 90%. You might say, what happened in the other 10%? This had to do with some technical issues of how they implemented their scan. They weren't able to guarantee that the bundles were stable, i.e. they solved the supersymmetry conditions, and they didn't check the full vacuum structure of the GLSM. But subject to the, the way that they were able to implement this, it seems that this prescription that I'm about to tell you about is a way of generating different heterotic geometries that give the same physics, just at the level of a GLSM. This is not understood at the level of a string duality. Um, this is not yet understood at the level of a nonlinear sigma model or any automorphism of the string world sheet, and it's not understood yet at the level of geometry. So I want to come at it from a geometric point of view in this talk. So the questions, um, the GLSM combinatorics that I'm about to tell you about lead to theories with the same spectra. Are they actually the same NLSM? So if you allow the GLSMs to flow to the full nonlinear sigma model, what are you going to get? Could they be the same string theory in a secret way? Um, could you have something like zero two mirrors, i.e. same single models, different geometries? Is there a, a world sheet automorphism? Could they be zero two geometric transitions? So we know of lots of examples in the case of type two string theories, um, i.e. Uh, conifolds and flops, where you can transition the effective theory um, in type two A or type two B. These are different uh, sigma models, but they are connected at a point in their vacuum space. Um, and importantly, from a physics point of view, this could be a practically powerful tool in that if I could understand how to write down different heterotic geometries, so different manifolds and bundles, and the rules for why I'm getting the same effective physics, that could allow me to, again, engineer better the effective field theories of interest. And I'd like to understand this um, at one pass purely in terms of geometry. So what's special about these pairs of a manifold and a bundle over it, topologically the distinct, that are going to give me the same physics? So again, here I'm going to focus on geometry. So first, um, let me review what it is this correspondence that I want to tell you a little bit about. How am I getting different heterotic theories with the same physics? So a brief reminder of what a zero two gauge linear sigma model is. This is an abelian massive 2D theory that is believed to flow to a zero two CFT. Um, I'm going to consider, you can consider non-abelian ones, I'm going to consider um, abelian GLSMs. Uh, I have a set of abelian gauge fields indexed by alpha. I have a set of chiral superfields that are charged under these U1s. Um, Fermi superfields, again, with a fixed charge. And I have to satisfy gauge and gravitational anomaly cancellation from the point of view of the 2D theory. And this gives me relationships um, such that these charges will cancel, both linear and quadratic conditions on the charges in the, the theory. We're going to encapsulate all the information of this 2D theory in a table. This is the so-called um, charge data of the GLSM. Here I just have the fields that I just listed. Uh, we'll see in a second that these fields up here in the first part of the table, the x's and gammas, these are going to encapsulate in a geometric phase uh, the data of the manifold, these down here, the data of a vector bundle. And we'll see how that goes in just a second. So um, the gauge linear sigma model has a super potential um, built out of the fields in play, uh, these gammas, uh, general homogeneous polynomials in the x's, and likewise over here. Uh, G and F are quasi-homogeneous polynomials with given multi-degree. Uh, they satisfy, this potential will give rise to F-term and D-term constraints to have a good vacuum that have to be set to zero. Um, there's a transversality condition that is normally imposed, which is that this polynomial here is going to be zero only when all the Xi's are zero. We'll see in a second why that is. Um, this is to guarantee good smooth geometries in a geometric phase. And there are Fi parameters associated to the OCU1s, which are going to control the phase structure of the GLSM. So, as most people have probably seen before, um, I will have, depending on the sign of this Fi parameter, I'm going to have different structure in the vacuum. So if the Fi parameter is greater than zero, inspection of the D and F terms shows you that we must have this homogeneous polynomial in the X is equal to zero, and um, the VEV of this P field also equal to zero. This would be what we call a geometric phase. In this case, the polynomial that is being zero in the X's, the X's can be viewed as a set of toric coordinates, 
uh, for some toric ambient space, and the zero locus of this polynomial or set of polynomials uh, will be defining a complete intersection, Calabi Yau variety, within a given ambient space. So the data uh, of the manifold is being specified by this guy. In addition, you can see that the solution to the rest of the D and F terms is actually going to build for you uh, a gauge bundle, which is built as a so-called monad sequence. Here, um, this complex is defining a bundle such that it is the kernel of a morphism between two sums of line bundles, F, uh, modded out by the image of this guy. So a map from the copies of the trivial bundle into, again, a set of line bundles. Um, what do I mean by these N and Ms? Well, these are exactly uh, the charges. Whoops, let's go back one more. Uh, these are the charges that appear in the GLSM fields. So viewing the Xs um, with their charges here as coordinates on an ambient space, the monad is defined as line bundles whose degree is specified by the charges in the associated GLSM. Okay, so this is a, a standard geometric phase. You say, I want to solve the, the um, GLSM with a phi parameter greater than zero. That gives you a manifold and a vector bundle over it in the zero-two theory. For non-geometric phases, the story is a little different. Um, here, we have to give a VEV to a p-field, um, and this reproduces for us, again, if we go back just for a second, um, if you look at the form of this zero-two superpotential, oops, up here, um, the superpotential, this will produce a Landau-Ginsberg-type superpotential in the case that this p-field is constant in vacuum. So let's go forward. Oops. So here, um, with constant VEV, uh, and non-trivial non VEV for the P, we end up with a Landau-Ginsberg-type superpotential. Um, here, all the Xs can vanish simultaneously uh, from the D and F terms, so this is a very non-geometric phase. If you have multiple U1s, this can be a hybrid phase, so you can be geometric in some regimes, non-geometric in others. Question? I'm about to do that, yeah. So this is, I, I completely agree, this is very hard to follow what the heck is going on from what I just said so far. So let's just do an example and we'll see where this comes from. Um, good. So that's the basic phase structure. Let me just tell you very quickly what the correspondence I'm going to do is, and then I'm going to work through that in, in detail in an example. So the observation from Disler and Katru was that in a Landau-Ginsberg phase, where the form of the superpotential is as follows, uh, these ingredients, these polynomials G and F, one of which in the geometric phase was defining the manifold, one of which was defining a vector bundle, um, they're on pretty much equal footing in a non-geometric phase. So here, this is basically just labeling in the Landau-Ginsberg superpotential which one is which. So they said, hey, you can actually switch what you call them in the Landau-Ginsberg phase and then try and come out again into a geometric phase. So if you can find one p-field that non-zero, um, you can rescale all your, your fields and relabel such that you're going to try and switch a G and an F in an anomaly consistent way. So here we don't have to worry about it too much. Um, we're going to move to a bundle, region of bundle moduli space where um, I have only one field getting a VEV for simplicity. And then there's a sim systematic relabeling that I'm allowed to do. And let's actually try this in an example because it's much easier to follow. So here is a specific example of a set of uh, toric weight coordinates in the XIs. Uh, this in a geometric phase, these two columns, sorry, two rows, columns, here are giving me the multi-degree in this ambient space of a Calabia threefold. And this is the data of a monad bundle defined over it. So this gives me an SU3 bundle. Um, if I look at the dimension of the apparent moduli space in a geometric phase, uh, this manifold has Hodge numbers 268 for this threefold, and I get 322 bundle moduli. Uh, if I were interested in the charge matter spectrum, I have 120, 27s of this E6 theory. But here, the neat thing is that I have, in a Landau-Ginsberg phase, I have a set of Gs, so these are the polynomials in these weights, degree 2,4 and degree 2,5, which can be interchanged in an anomaly consistent way with some Fs. So the sum of the third and the fourth F equals the sum of the two hypersurface degrees, and this gives me a very explicit set of relabeling that I can do while preserving all anomalies of the theory. So the superpotential has this form. Uh, once I put everything with the tildes, if I go forward, uh, I can get a new set of charges, now relabeled, in which I've switched what was an F and what was a G. And this allows me to write down now a new set of charges, which I can try and find a geometric vacuum for. So this allows me to write down just a new GLSM. I can forget that I just got this from relabeling a Landau-Ginsberg phase of one theory, and just say, what is the vacuum structure of this new set of charges that I've written down? And it turns out that I can work out what 
this guy is. This is a topologically distinct Calabiao. It has Hodge numbers 295. Uh, these guys, again, coordinates. This guy is the degree of the uh, single hypersurface equation. And this is a bundle over it. Here, I have different Hodge numbers for the base, 295, and also a different number of vector bundle moduli for this bundle. However, the sum of metric degrees of freedom, h11 and h21, and vector bundle moduli has added up to the same number. If we go back, 392, as it did in the original geometry. So these are in no sense the same geometric data, different manifold, different bundle, uh, different topology, but they happen to give the same net number of moduli, and they appear to be connected in that in a landau ginzburg phase, they can be relabeled into one another. In this particular example, H11 stayed fixed, so uh, did not change. This was two in both cases, and only the complex structure and bundle moduli of the theory got interchanged in this rewriting. Um, in more general examples, it is possible to increase the number of U1s in this correspondence. In the interest of time, I'm not going to illustrate that. Um, but in principle, you can mix all moduli in this type of relabeling. So you write down a GLSM, find a non-geometric phase, do some relabeling, find a new large volume limit. And in that process, what you'll find is that the net number of moduli is preserved, and they're all scrambled what was Kähler, what was complex structure, what was bundle moduli. OK, that was pretty fast. Um, for the purposes of the rest of this talk, I don't need you to know the, the nitty gritties of how you actually do this relabeling. What I do need is that the, the general overview of this GLSM structure is clear. So any questions on that, please let me know. So the question, how are these dual theories actually related? So as I mentioned, Blumenhagen and Round tried to understand this by doing a lot of examples. Um, one question is, this is all so far um, just an observation of in one phase of the theory, I can do relabeling. I can count and observe that the massless spectrum appears to be the same. But that doesn't tell me a heck of a lot about the structure of the 40 theory yet. It tells me I have the same number of zero modes, but could I go further? So one question we want to ask is, can this duality be tested even uh, in the geometric perturbative regime in more detail? So a few years ago with my student, one question that we wanted to ask was, are these n equals 1 4D theories actually the same at the structure of their vacuum space, not just their zero modes. So since these are n equals 140 theories, there are potentials that can obstruct flat directions, and your apparent geometric moduli need not be your actual geometric moduli. So we want more than the naive uh, dimension of the moduli space, which is the sum of the Calabria moduli and the bundle moduli. You want to say, can I actually calculate the full um, infinitesimal directions of moduli? Can I understand the obstructions? And does that actually get mapped across this duality as well? So the first question I want to ask is, can we compare the effective potential in vacuum space of a chain of dual theories? Now, I haven't made this clear yet. Um, I've been talking about pairs. So I say, have a GLSM, do a relabeling, come out as another GLSM. Frequently, there is more than one choice. So unlike um, mirror symmetry in the normal sense, in which you have exactly two manifolds that are you know, getting uh, interchanged under uh, a, a world sheet automorphism, in this case, there can be whole chains, order 35 different uh, choices from one GLSM starting point where you can write down many different theories, all of which will have the same spectrum. So this is not uh, a pairing in that sense, but a whole connected set. Um, so can we do this where we can actually compare the vacuum space across one of these chains? And to do that, you have to be able to engineer examples with interesting and calculable potentials. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, remember that the structure of the potential, I said at the beginning, um, is very much linked to the conditions for n equals 1 supersymmetry in the 40 n equals 1 theory. So specifically at the level of geometry, um, the conditions for supersymmetry are that the, um, in a Calabia background, the vector bundle has to satisfy the so-called hermitian yang mills equations, uh, namely that the 2, 0 and 0, 2 parts of the field strength are 0, and the trace of the 1, 1 part with the metric also has to vanish. Thanks to the theorem of, of Donaldson, Ulen, Beck, and Yao, we know that this condition uh, is one-to-one -one with the vector bundle being slope-stable, actually slope-polystable, strictly. Um, just a quick reminder, what does it mean to be slope-stable? We can define the slope as uh, the wedging together of the first trim class of the bundle with Kähler forms, and a bundle is called stable if this quasi-topological number that you can associate to it and every subsheaf of it uh, obeys the conditions that for every subsheaf with rank strictly less than that of the bundle, the slope is also strictly less than that of the bundle. Um, a bundle is called polystable if it's a direct sum of stable objects, all with the same slope. So this is what it means to satisfy this condition. What does it mean to satisfy the other one? That's much easier. 
the condition that the two not and not two parts of the field string vanish is simply that the vector bundle is holomorphic. And it has been appreciated in the physics literature for some time that um, stability is one-to-one -one with the effective theory having 4D uh, non-trivial D terms and holomorphy equivalent to 4D non-trivial F terms. So what I want to do is uh, generate examples with abstractions, bundles that are not everywhere stable or holomorphic in the moduli space of their base manifold. I want to track it through this duality and see what happens. Uh, so as I just said, let's constr uh, construct very special geometries that are not generically solving the equations I just wrote down. Um, what would that look like? For example, bundles that are strictly polystable. So stability is an open property in the moduli space, but polystability is not. So if you have a strictly polystable bundle, then that can restrict um, the Kähler moduli of your theory, and you can view that in the 4D effective theory through D terms. Uh, if the bundle is holomorphic only for a sublocus in the complex structure moduli space of its base manifold, then this will again appear as 4D F term obstructions. Okay, so what's going to happen with that? So here's an example of a 02 GLSM. Um, if you write this down naively, you would see that this is a rank five vector bundle with C1 equals zero. You would assume that this would lead to a SU5 4D theory. You can calculate the naive dimension of the moduli space. Uh, here, the sum of H11, 21 in the bundle moduli adds up to 428. However, a closer inspection of this bundle shows that this is actually only stable on a ray in a one-dimensional ray within its two-dimensional Kähler moduli space. So you have one fewer uh, degrees of freedom than you might have thought in this case. Um, in fact, despite the fact that you're writing this as a general monad bundle, um, the only supersymmetric configuration of this bundle is for it to split as a object um, with C1 equals zero and rank three plus the sum of a line bundle in its dual. Okay, so features of interest in this example. The non-trivial D term in the 4D theory due to this polystable bundle lifts one Kähler modulus. This leads to a simple reduction in the net number of moduli by one. In addition, because this bundle is generically polystable at every point in its supersymmetric locus, every um, point in its, its supersymmetric uh, uh, moduli space, this will lead to a non-abelian enhancement from the symmetry that you thought you were going to write down. So the structure group is not SU5, rather it is actually forced to enhance to SU6 times U1. Um, because the structure group of the bundle is reducible, you have S of U1 times U1 times SU3. Uh, this factor here is self-commuting within E8. So this gives you SU6 times U1. Um, the U1 will be green Schwartz massive. The bundle is forced to the locus with non-abelian symmetry enhancement. And from this so-called stability wall, this sub-wall in the Kähler uh, moduli space, you could try and actually deform this object in a rank-changing way by giving VEVs to bundle moduli such that you could, in the effective theory, Higgs this SU6 down to SU5. So you can ask how much of this could be visible in the target space tools. I've engineered an example with a lot of structure. Now I want to say what can happen to it uh, across this correspondence. So in this particular case, you can construct a chain of 17 target space dual geometries. Um, all of the base manifolds, uh, the Calabiaos, are actually going to increase H11 by 1. So what do we get in one of these cases? So one example of a target space dual is the following. Uh, this Calabiao threefold is related to the original one by a conifold transition. Uh, the bundle over it is not immediately obvious where this thing came from, but from the relabeling that we just did, you can now ask, how do these features that I just described get carried through the correspondence? So first, um, does this manifold bundle pair give rise to a, quote, stability wall, i.e., is there substructure in the moduli space due to the form of this? Um, once again, we find that this bundle is, in fact, uh, forced to become reducible. So the structure group and the non-abelian symmetry enhancement occurs in this example as well. Um, this gets packaged through exactly. Naively, the dimension of the moduli space appears to disagree with what you'd expect. You get a 429-dimensional moduli space. But when you take into account the stability structure of this bundle and how it's constraining the Kähler moduli, you drop back down to 427, as expected. Structure group, charge matter, spectrum of the two theories agree exactly. What about the vacuum structure of that theory? So I'm starting with a polystable bundle at a locus in Kähler moduli space. I now want to deform to some different bundle nearby, and I want to ask, does that um, deformation in field space, i.e. just from the point of view of a 4D n equals 1 theory, do the flat directions in that potential get mapped across this duality? And what you find is actually really neat is that apparently all the, dimension, all the deformations that you can track, um, you can map into geometry, and you get a surprisingly commutative diagram. So if you start with a vector bundle, you give a VEV to some charged matter to deform the structure group and move in moduli space, 
you can do that one of two ways. You can either start with your initial geometry, move in field space, so follow a flat direction in the n equals 1 theory, or you can take the target space dual, deform that guy, move in its vacuum space, and when you look at what you've gotten, they are actually also target space dual. So this GLSM correspondence is tracking with you in vacuum space in a very non-trivial way. So as you move in one direction, the target space dual is moving in the other, and this is preserving the structure of the relabeling that you used to build the GLSMs, which, at least to me, was a surprise. I did not think that that automatically had to happen from what was obvious um, from the structure of the GLSM. Okay, perhaps um, more importantly, uh, in addition to tracking something like D-terms, uh, the form of these potential obstructions actually have a lot to tell you about how the, the degrees of freedom are getting packaged in a meaningful way. So let me look at the F-term obstructions next, and let me try and use those to uh, extract some structure that I hope will shed some light on the geometry in general. So the first statement is, um, again, that the vector bundle is holomorphic if it satisfies these equations. Uh, a very obvious statement is those equations involve what you mean by barred and unbarred coordinates on the Calabia threefold. So if you begin varying the complex structure, a bundle that it began as holomorphic need not stay holomorphic as you vary the complex structure. So what happens? In general, if you just look at this equation and say, how does it vary? It's very obvious what happens. Um, you're going to get two contributions that better cancel out. Uh, you need a fluctuation that rotates what was a 1-1 one, one component of your field strength, that's this is, uh, in background zero, gets rotated into something 2 naught, and you can have fluctuations of the connection that are not D-bar closed. And so those two better cancel each other in this infinitesimal fluctuation in order to keep your vector bundle holomorphic. So this was studied, this bit of geometry was studied by Atia in the 1950s. Um, this is a very well-known structure. Um, this is modeled, the solution to this equation is modeled um, by the so-called Atia sequence, whose associated long exact sequence in cohomology tells you that the infinitesimal deformations that you're interested in for the complex system of a manifold and a bundle are counted by H1Q, this middle term in the sequence. Um, specifically, you have a given map structure. If this is subjective, then your uh, bundle moduli and the complex moduli of your manifold split in the way that was normally assumed in the literature. If it's not subjective, then you have a more complicated thing to determine. Um, and this is determined by the class of the uh, background 1-1 one, one part of the field strength. This is known as the Atiyah class. So this can be packaged in a more straightforward way by just reminding you of three separate objects in deformation theory that were kind of mixed together in the early days of heterotic compactifications in the physics literature. So the first is we are all familiar, hopefully, with deformations of complex manifolds. Uh, if you have a compact complex manifold, infinitesimal deformations are measured by the dimension of H1 of Tx, the holomorphic tangent bundle. In the case of Calabi threefolds, that's measured by H21. Those are what we would normally call the complex structure deformations of that manifold. Deformations of the bundle itself for fixed complex structure moduli of its base are just fluctuations of the connection that are appropriately debar closed. These are measured by H1, in our case, of the traceless endomorphisms of V. These are what we would normally call the vector bundle moduli. But the point I'm making is that for the vacuum structure of the heterotic theory, you actually want a different deformation space. And this was the one studied by Atiyah. This is the simultaneous deformation space of a manifold, the vector bundle and its base manifold. And this, again, is given by the Atiyah sequence. Uh, its infinitesimal uh, tangent space is counted by the dimension of H1Q, where that is built from this guy. Now, the thing I want to mention, because this is going to be important in a minute, is that this can be simply realized, um, and this I first learned this in a paper by Donaldson, um, that this infinitesimal deformations of the pair could be simply thought of as take your vector bundle over your manifold, projectivize the fibers to turn it into a compact manifold. Um, that compact manifold will deform in a normal complex way where its dimension is H1 Tx for the tangent space. However, because it has a nice vibration structure, you can push everything forward to the base, and that turns into this sequence. Phrased differently, the infinitesimal complex moduli of a bundle and its base manifold can be viewed in terms of the projectivized total space of the bundle, where Q is just the push forward of the holomorphic tangent bundle of the total space. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, from the 4D point of view, this is not always possible at regimes in the theory where you have good control to be able to write down these F terms. You need some sort of special structure, which I'm not going to get into in huge detail. But in general, you expect that these um, F term obstructions that are modeling this geometric obstruction of holomorphy, these are going to appear as gukov vafa witten type superpotentials, um, where omega, capital omega here is the holomorphic 3 naught form, and H is the 3 form of heterotic theory that is built out of uh, the 2 form and 
omega-3 Yang Mills and omega-3 Lorentz. These are the churn simons forms um, built out of the gauge field and the spin connection. So in order to have a good Minkowski vacuum, we need the F terms to be zero. You can work out, um, based on dimensional reduction and a fluctuation around a background, in physics language, what would that F term obstruction look like? And you can reparameterize exactly the math description that I just gave you. So the fluctuation analysis from geometry can also be viewed um, in field theory. So computationally the same as ATIA obstructions in principle. Um, the superpotential observations were in literature since the 80s. The hard part is actually engineering calculable examples. So the idea that you could have um, obstructions of this type, in principle, were known. How do you build bundles that can obstruct the complex structure of their base manifolds? The idea is to build them in such a way that the ingredients that you use to build the bundle, and I'll say more about that in just in a second, crucially depend on the complex structure. So let me give you an example of such a thing for a monad, because that's what I'm interested in in the context of this target space duality. So um, how do I build target space dual examples with holomorphy obstructions? Let's consider this bundle. Um, this is writing down what I would hope would be an SU2 bundle over a Calabi out threefold, single hypersurface in a product of uh, P1 and P3 here. Uh, the problem is that if I look at the map structure that I would need to map this sum of line bundles into this guy, um, what I find is that this does not define a good stable bundle for generic choices of the complex structure. I'm missing a map, um, specifically the map from this guy into this one, which is generically zero. So this is not a well-defined bundle for generic points in the complex structure moduli space. However, line bundle cohomology can jump on a Calabi L3 fold as you move in the complex structure moduli space. And this is actually an incredibly rich structure. So we've analyzed this for some Calabi Ls, the way that um, line bundle cohomology can shift as you move around in complex structure. There can be hundreds of different sub loci in the complex structure moduli space with different bundle valued cohomology and hence different moduli spaces of stable sheaves that can be supported over them. So um, in a paper from a number of years ago, we actually analyzed this particular jumping cohomology and showed that on a 53-dimensional sublocus of complex structure moduli space, uh, that this cohomology jumps to being non-zero. And you can prove that on that locus in complex structure moduli space, it is possible to define a good bundle supported by these charges in the GLSM, a good monad. So I don't have time to go through this in, in great detail, but the punchline is you can say, now I have a bundle that's obstructed holomorphy. Let me take it through the, the target space dual. What happens? Uh, once again, you find that the moduli reduction matches exactly. And this did not have to be the case. The fact that um, non-trivially you have a bundle that now is also not uh, generically holomorphic on the other side, something of a surprise. Um, I don't want to go through that e example in detail. Instead, I want to now use the observations that I just made about the structure of this moduli space. I want to try and take a step back now and say, what is going on with this correspondence that I've laid out? I've argued that it's working better than expected in terms of reproducing the massless spectrum and flat directions of the theory. Can we understand at the level of geometry what's really happening? So um, can I try and package this? So the thing I want to try and understand is in the case of this target space duality or in potential other heterotic redundancies, can we actually produce the projectivized total space of the vector bundle, which we know captures the combined complex deformations of the manifold in a nice way, can we compare what those total spaces as manifolds look like across one of these correspondences and see if we can spot what is the essential structure that the heterotic theory is really tracking? So um, there will be questions that you could ask both at the level of the metric i.e. if I have the projectivized total space as a manifold, what's happening to the metric on that space as I restrict to fiber and base? These are differential geometry questions. And I could also ask this question just at the level of the topology or the algebraic description of such a space. I'm going to focus on the latter first. So inspired by, by gauge linear sigma models, let me take a step back and just say I want to consider the case of a complete intersection in a toric variety um, that's going to build for me a Calabi manifold X and a vector bundle defined by the monad, as I just argued before, arises in GLSMs. A simple result that we were able to prove is that in this case, the projectivized total space of the bundle takes a very simple form. If V is a stable holomorphic SUN bundle over such a base Galabian manifold, um, and defined by a monad sequence of this form, then uh, this will be true, this description will hold, if and only if it's projectivized total space um, of this dimension, where N is the rank of my bundle here, um, is a Kähler toric complete intersection manifold. So the toric structure that was sort of innate in GLSMs is actually getting preserved as you combine fiber and base together into one complete manifold. Um, I'm not saying anything terribly deep here, just that 
once you consider the bundle as a complete manifold over its base, it is also possible to view this as being uh, cut out by polynomial equations within some big toric variety. So as an illustrative example, here's a manifold, Calabiao um, in P5, defined by the complete intersection of a degree two and degree four hypersurface with a monad bundle over it. Um, the apparent dimension of this moduli space is 249. And in a simple case like this one, you can show that the uh, description of the projectivized total space can be written as a complete intersection of five equations in P6 times P5. This is not a Calabiao because of the form of the fibers. Um, this is a Kähler sixfold with H11 equals two and H1 uh, of its infinitesimal tangent space equals two of 48. So the neat feature, um, the ambient space is determined by the ambient spaces of the bundle and the monad. So if the manifold itself is a complete intersection, Calabiao in some toric ambient space, and if the vector bundle is a monad, you can define the fiber space of that monad as a complete intersection in the projectivization of the middle term of the monad. Here B uh, refers to the middle term here in the initial uh, definition. And uh, in general, this is not a product as it is here. Um, this will be some non-trivial twist. It's a general toric variety. Okay, punchline. You can simply write down a total space now as a toric complete intersection. So why do we care? Um, the total space, you can write down torically its description of its tangent bundle. So now let me just focus on this as a manifold. I'm no longer thinking about the gauge bundle as being separate from the base geometry. I can write down Euler and a junction type sequences defining that tangent space. And I can say, can I reproduce from that um, or extract from that any features of interest? So something that's going to be helpful is given any monad sequence um, of this type where again here uh, the maps compose to zero as I mentioned before and you can define the vector bundle as the Kerr mod M. Um, you will have associated to it a display of the so-called monad where you can build relationships between the kernel and co-kernel of these maps. We'll return to this in just a second. The reason this is useful is that you can reconstruct the vector bundle and the base manifold from the total space um, by simply restricting that uh, tangent space that I wrote down for the general toric variety to the fiber and base. So for example, uh, you can use the display of the monad to reconstruct uh, the monad sequence itself. So here V goes to B goes to Z. This is the kernel sequence from this morphism um, by looking at the relative tangent bundle to the fibers uh, and restricting. So from each part of the geometry, it's possible to reconstruct others. So this is useful for systematically, um, potentially classifying heterotic theories in that it's very easy to write code, for example, that can generate lots of complete intersections. We've done this to generate kreutzer skarka databases or complete intersection Calabiaus. Um, now we could be generating non Calabiao toric complete intersections, which could correspond to now total spaces of bundles and manifolds over them. So this could be useful in principle for repackaging the geometry. But what I really want this for is a way to ask where are the degrees of freedom of the heterotic theory in this picture and have I learned anything interesting about the structure of that geometry. So um, the first thing you notice is that the infinitesimal tangent space as we designed it to do a la uh, Atiyah and Donaldson is counting for us the complex moduli of the heterotic theory. So the, the infinitesimal complex deformations of this thing are getting packaged in a nice way uh, bundle moduli and complex structure. Uh, H11 of this Kähler manifold uh, is counted by H11 of the base plus one. Um, this might seem like because I've projectivized the fiber, I have a non-dynamical Kähler mode now in the picture, which is the volume uh, of the fiber. You might be cheeky and say, well, I have one other modulus that I care about in the heterotic theory, which is the dilaton. Can I interpret that in a useful way? Uh, that's a question mark so far. And perhaps most usefully, in this projectivized total space, there is a tautological line bundle um, which exists, which is uniquely determined by the properties that its restriction to the fiber is a hyperplane, uh, and its push forward to the base will reconstruct for you the bundle that you initially projectivized. So um, moreover, this is determining the topology, the C1 of this manifold. Now, here's where it's really interesting. Um, for cases of interest, now you have the cohomology of this line bundle can exactly match the cohomology of the vector bundle on the base. The reason this is nice is that line bundle cohomology on toric varieties is something that is very straightforward to compute. So again, from the point of view of engineering heterotic theories, you've reduced a hairy calculation of computing bundle valued cohomology on some manifold down to the simpler problem of computing line bundle cohomology on a different manifold. Moreover, you can easily write down the turn classes of this total space, which are simple functions of the physical ingredients. Uh, for the GLSM, I've imposed that C2 of the manifold and C2 of the bundle are exactly equal, uh, and you have the third turn class, which counts the chiral index of this theory. 
Okay, so where have I gotten to? Where do I want to go? Um, what I've tried to argue for you so far is that zero two target space duality seems to work surprisingly well for something that isn't yet a string duality. So there's an interesting hint that there's a lot of structure in zero two theories and heterotic compactifications that should be better understood. Um, this seems to lead to a wealth of intriguing geometric correspondences, both in the structure of the vacuum space, and it would be useful to understand this both from a string sigma model point of view as well as geometrically uh, why this sort of thing is happening. So um, we've begun a systematic rewriting of the heterotic geometry in terms of that total space. I just gave you a feel for some simple calculations you can do to read off the spectrum and moduli of that total space. Um, you might say, well, what actually happened when you go through target space duals? What we see is that in the simplest cases, all of the topology that we can read off of these total spaces in the case of a target space dual theory appears to be identical. They have the same Hodge numbers, they have the same Chern classes, they would seem at the level of topology to be identical total spaces, even though you have built them as distinct projectivizations of different manifolds and bundles, topologically distinct manifolds and bundles. That seems to arise in the simplest cases. Um, in other cases, uh, it is possible that you may be able to see geometric transitions from the point of view of this total space that actually correspond to something like heterotic conifolds. So you can track geometric transitions, for example, conifolds or flops in the base manifold, and say what happens to the fibers over them as you track this toric um, complete intersection across that correspondence. It is still an open question whether all uh, geometric transitions that you could do in the total space would actually correspond to legitimate transitions in a, a 4D effective field theory point of view. This is something that we're looking at now. But it's intriguing that there seems to be a, from this, this target space duality, there seems to be a packaging that is preserving these essential features of the 4D uh, effective theory. So what is the, the outlook for this? There's a huge amount of geometry and uh, physics still to be understood. This could correspond to some new zero two duality at a fundamental level. Maybe this is just a hint for how we need to package degrees of freedom in a heterotic theory in a better way to read off the effective field theory. This could be um, useful for building effective field theories of your choice, i.e. string phenomenology, or perhaps building data sets of heterotic geometries like we have done for Calabi-Yau's that allow us to more systematically construct things. Um, and further study is definitely warranted and underway. And I will stop there. Are there any questions? Thanks. Do you have examples of this uh, target space duality in, uh, in six-dimensional compactifications of heterotic strings, like uh, 0, 0,4 models? That's a great question. So yes, you do, um, but they're boring. So um, exactly the same correspondence goes through in 60 as would in 4, and there's a combinatorics that allows you to shuffle a bunch of charges. Um, when you do this in, in the, the constructions that you get, um, you will see that you always obviously get K3, K3 manifolds, and by construction, the C2 of the bundle is preserved in the relabeling. So because the massless spectrum is entirely determined in um, six-dimensional heterotic compactifications by the index, um, there's no obstructions you were guaranteed to produce the same effective physics and that you will always reproduce the same moduli space of bundles over K3, just different points in it using target space duality. Um, one slightly more interesting thing that does happen is that in some cases, you seem to end up at singular K3s in this correspondence. Um, and that might hint at some sort of perturbative, non-perturbative duality. I have not looked at that in great detail or, or sort of seen in the 60 picture whether these are actually good duals. So maybe something in the correspondence is breaking down. Um, but that's, that's one hint, there might be a bit more structure in 60, but this, this really only gets topologically interesting in 40. So, uh, so somewhere between uh, somehow a quality of numbers, like you were saying at the beginning, and a string duality would be a matching, would, would, a matching of DG Lee algebras associated to the deformation problems, which sounds like what you were uh, describing had to be there in terms of once you account for the obstructions, then they start to match. Yes. So, so, so can you say what those DG Lee algebras are that you're matching up? At the moment, not yet. But I would agree that such a correspondence should exist. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, it raises a number of questions, but just thinking as always about like the F theory duel. So, so a really elementary question is, 
when you switch the geometry and the bundle, the bundle is in, sense, in a sense encoded by two disjoint sets of degrees of freedom. So somehow you're taking one set of degrees of freedom and splitting them into two. And if you go to the F-theory dual, in general, those two sets of degrees of freedom usually seem much larger than the one set of degrees of, I mean, if you think about the slice versus all the things on one side versus the other, unless you tune a very large gauge group on the F-theory side, it seems like the number of degrees of freedom won't be compatible. So do you have any comment on how the number of degrees of freedom is compatible and how the geometry splits into two parts for the bundle? So, so you're saying, isn't it the case that I'll have more degrees of freedom in the total space than I do in the manifold bundle pair? Is that the question? Or are you no, saying, when in F theory, I'll have more degrees of freedom? On the F theory side, it looks like you have more degrees of freedom for the bundle than you do for the geometry in general. Uh, I see your point. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, that's true in these examples, yeah. But you're, you're flipping, oh, I see. But you're flipping one for the other, so then after you flip, you must It's, it's not a, like a mirror switch. In that I'm not just like flipping one. I'm sort of mixing parts of both. So it, in general, in the examples that I saw, sort of a handful, like order 20 moduli are swapping around. Um, you could ask whether there's any extremal cases where like literally everything goes the other way. I've never seen any no, like that. You're saying it's not that you're just switching it's, it's not just a binary swap. -um. It's, it's a much more complicated mixing of some from here and some from here get shuffled and then you come back out. Okay, thanks. That clarifies it. Uh, further questions? Yes. I should be a little bit careful. I, I want to say yes. I mean, there's a question about how much of the non-perturbative nature of the string you might try and encode in this formalism. So I can also, of course, non-perturbatively obstruct moduli through World Street instantons, blah, blah, blah. So how much of a, uh, you know, a classical versus you know, a non-perturbative moduli space I want to build into the game might change that story. But at first pass for a perturbative theory, I would be interested to know what the answer is just yeah, just for, for the manifold and the base. Are there further questions? If not, let's uh, thank Laura again. On to lunch. Thank you.